Hello Northern Lifers, Managing Editor Mark Gentili here back with the seventh and final uh, hour-long conversation with one of the candidates in the upcoming October 19 federal election. To my left we have political affairs reporter Darren McDonald and across the table from me we have the man of this particular hour, Claude Gravel from Nickel Belt. How are you doing today Mr. Gravel? Doing great. Yeah? Thank you very much for having me. You're very, very welcome. Thanks, uh, thanks for being here on a, on a Monday morning mm -hmm. and taking some time out from the campaign to, uh, to sit down with, uh, with us. You're welcome. Uh, so just a little bit about what we're going to do here. Uh, as I've said, uh, as I told you before we started, and as I've said before we've done these events uh, in the past, um, this is an opportunity to try and learn a little bit more about you, to, mm -hmm. uh, to give the voters more of a picture of who the Claude Gravel is that they don't see at all candidates' debates or in sound bites on television or, or that sort of thing. So we want to learn a little bit more about you. We want to talk about some of the issues uh, in the campaign. We want to maybe challenge you on a few things. Uh, but really, we just we want to have a, have a nice conversation with you mm -hmm. about, uh, about what, who you are and, and uh, what you can offer to the uh, fine folks out in Nickel Belt. Okay. Excellent. So um, let's talk about the polls first, I guess. Over the weekend, there was a new poll came out uh, showing the, uh, the NDP uh, slid a little bit uh, in, in things. Wondering about your thoughts on uh, two weeks out from the vote. Uh, where you, uh, where you think, see things standing? Well, uh, two weeks out uh, from the vote in 2011, we were at 15%. So I'm not concerned at all. I think we're going to do very well in all of the provinces, and uh, we're going to form, form the next, uh, next government. Yeah. What do, you, what do you make of the slide in Quebec? What do you, what do you make? What do you, uh, uh, polls go up and down. Yeah. I mean, we were up, and now we're down, and we're going to go back up. It's as simple as that. And the real poll is October 19th. None of the others count. <laughs> Um, now, since you were first elected back in uh, 2008, um, you, are, there, are there things that you feel like uh, th that have changed in Canada or changed in, in, in the federal government uh, in, since you, you first uh, went to Ottawa? Well, absolutely. Since 2008, since uh, Harper became our, uh, our prime minister, things have definitely changed in Canada. We've, we've gone to, from a nation, of, uh, a loving nation, to a nation that's uh, not so loving anymore. And uh, I think we have to... Uh, go back uh, to the way we were before Stephen Harper, a caring nation, a loving nation, and embrace, uh, embrace the world. Let's track that a little bit. What do you mean we are a, a less loving nation today than we were, you know, seven, eight years ago? Well, uh, Stephen Harper uh, has made it uh, very difficult for, uh, for people, for Canadians. He's made it very difficult for Canadians to, uh, to be loving. He's uh, cut funding to a lot of, uh, a lot of charities. He, he's cut a lot of things uh, for seniors. He's, he's brought the uh, retirement age up to, to 67, and that's not, that's not helpful. Uh, those are things that, uh, that hurt Canadians, and uh, we want to bring it back to uh, uh, pre-2008, the, the, the level of, uh, of uh, Canadian caring. Okay. Can, can you give me a couple of examples, maybe, of, of how, how Harper, you say, has, has hurt Canadians? Mm -hmm. uh, where's this kinder, gentler Canada that we used to have? Well, I, I, it's, it's not here right now. Uh, we, need, we need a kinder uh, Canada, mm -hmm. and uh, Thomas Mulcair is going to bring us back to pre-2008. Uh, an example of uh, Stephen Harper cutting on, on, on charities. Uh, that's, that, that hurts. Uh, a lot of uh, Canadians... Uh, donate to charities to help people because we are a kind and gentle uh, nation. And uh, uh, Stephen Harper has uh, um, sort of uh, end endangered us in that way. He's endangered us Well, in that way. maybe endangered is not the right word, but he's changed. He's made things very difficult for Canadians. Okay. He's made things very difficult for charities. Yeah. Interesting. <coughs> so maybe just step back a bit. We usually, we've been asking people their sort of backgrounds and biographies. Like, where were you born? Were you born in? I was born in uh, Vermilion Lake. Uh, I was born there in uh, Vermilion Lake, and I was uh, raised on a farm. I lived on a farm till I was 18. What kind of farm? Uh, an, an old, uh, typical uh, farm from, from the 50s and 60s. Uh, we had cows, we had pigs, we had chickens. And uh, that's probably why, uh, uh, where I got my work ethic from. Uh, because it was uh, the boys in the barn, the girls in the kitchen with mom. And when we came home from school, we did our homework, and then we had to go help dad in the barn or in the field. And uh, that's been my, my work ethic ever since. I um, did some, uh, when I was a student, I picked tobacco, which is a very, very hard job. I worked for uh, uh, CP Rail. The, uh, it was called at the time the Extra Gang. 
and we did all of the all of the hard work. And then I worked in the construction for a summer. Uh, we actually built the uh, worked on building the Northland Hotel in, in Chemistry. And in the uh, September of that same year, I got hired on at uh, at Inco, and I worked there for uh, 34 years at Inco. And um, I was um, you underground, or I was a machinist. I did a lot of work on surface, and I did a lot of work underground. <coughs> so I know what it's like to spend the day underground. Uh, I was fortunate enough uh, in uh, 1972 to uh, meet the, the love of my life, and uh, we were married in. 74. Uh, we're going to be celebrating our 41st anniversary next week. Oh, we have uh, two uh, lovely kids uh, that are unfortunately both in, in British Columbia and they were brought there by, because of work. And I have two uh, just uh, lovely grandchildren that I just uh, unfortunately don't, uh, don't see uh, often enough. Uh, I see them uh, almost weekly on, on Skype but it's not the same thing as uh, having them in, in your arms. Now, now, growing up on a farm, did you guys have time to talk politics? Were you a political family at all? Or? Uh, my whole um, mother's side of the family was very, uh, very political. And so we did talk about uh, politics. I had a, a grandfather who was uh, the mayor. I had an uncle who was uh, also a mayor, a, cousin, a couple of cousins that were uh, councillors. Uh, in Chelmsford? In Chelmsford, yes, in Chelmsford and uh, in, in, in the... Uh, also, when we amalgamated with, uh, with, with Azilda, and uh, it was the uh, municipality of Rayside Balfour at the time, so I had an uncle who sat on that council, and I sat on that council for, for four years also, uh, from uh, 96 to 2000. Uh, my actual term uh, was supposed to be three years, but because of uh, amalgamation, our term was extended by, by a full year. So I served a full term on council, uh, an extended term, and I was... Uh, really really happy with that I was very proud of the work that we were able to accomplish on that council uh, and uh, that I, I think that's why I love the job I'm doing uh, so much right now how did you get involved with the New Democrats I got involved with the uh, New Democrats uh, back in 1971 on uh, Floyd Logren's very first campaign and uh, I did some uh, volunteering for him uh, I got to know Floyd quite well, and he uh, was just, uh, I admired him, uh, the work that he did, and uh, that's how I became involved, and I've been involved ever since, and it's just, they have my values, my, my family value, values, my so social values, it's just a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, experience having worked with, uh, first of all, uh, Floyd Logren and then Shelley Martel, and now Franz Jelena, it's just uh, a great experience. How old were you in, on that first campaign? 18. You were 18? Yeah. That's pretty young to get to, to yeah. volunteer yeah. for it, an election campaign. So what compelled you to, to drive, dive into, you know, to volunteer? I, I, I've a, been a community volunteer all my life. Sure. Uh, well, there's I, lots of community volunteers, but not a lot of, you know, not, not a lot of 18-year-olds volunteer no, to get involved in politics. No, so. but it, uh, it's just something I wanted to do. Um, my friend uh, at the time uh, was involved, so we both went and, and volunteered for Floyd. Uh, but volunteerism for me has been a lifelong uh, experience. Uh, I've been a volunteer in uh, minor hockey, minor baseball, broom ball. Uh, I was on the board member of the uh, libraries, the fire department. Uh, I did a lot of uh, volunteering and I just uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. And sometimes volunteering is almost the same thing as, as, as being in politics uh, because you have to dance around certain, certain issues, certain people, and I think that's where I got it from. I really enjoyed volunteer. I, was on the first board of the Rayside Balfour Youth Center, which is still going strong, and uh, I'm sure it'll be going for, for, for many, many years. We were able to, to help a lot, of, uh, a lot of teenagers, a lot of kids, uh, keep them out of trouble, uh, give them something to do. A lot of the kids today uh, uh, go home and there's nobody home, so they came to the youth center, and we just uh, took care of them, and it was a great experience, great experience. I loved every minute of it. A lot of volunteers, you know, talk about how, how the practice of volunteering sort of enriches their lives. Yes. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you've gotten out of it? Well, it's, uh, it's, it, it just enriches your life. I mean, it's, uh, you work with others uh, to, to help others, and uh, it's such a, a rewarding uh, thing to do, uh, being a volunteer. It doesn't matter if it's uh, Little League, minor hockey, youth center, libraries. It's just that you have to 
it's just enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You're you're uh, now you're you're from a French Canadian family, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. um, so the you know there's a there's a um, there's a certain, uh, I don't, I'm trying to think of the correct, the right word. Uh, Franco Ontarians, French Canadians, they're very proud of their, of their culture, mm -hmm. you know, and they, they demonstrate that in more, uh, more uh, public ways, maybe, mm -hmm. or uh, more passionate ways yeah. than, than English Canada does. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, what is it about the French culture that? that well, it's just the, the way we were brought up. It's just, it's the culture. <laughs> Uh, when we have a party, it's a good party. <laughs> it's a song and dancing, and uh, it's like uh, going to a, a really good French uh, hoot nanny. It's it's a lot of fun, and that's just the way it is with French Canadians. Uh, my my wife is 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 uh, from from Quebec. She's a Quebecois, and uh, and it's the same thing over there. We just have a good time. It's it's not uh, not different from one French Canadian family to another. It's just the same. We just like to have fun. Good, clean fun at a party. There, there's a lot of francophones in Nickel Belt, yep. but there's also there's people in the South End. Yep. I mean, it's, it's a big riding. What kind of approach do you take to campaigning to a riding that diverse, that spread out, but with a lot of you know people who want to see your face at the door? Well, I, I um, campaign steady. Uh, it never it never stops. Uh, I, I go to uh, communities uh, at least twice a year. Well, some of them. I, I have community clinics twice a year in every single community that is within, uh, is not too close to my um, camp, my, cam, my um, constituency office. Uh, for example, I'll go to Foliette twice a year uh, and I do a little bit of neighborhood canvassing or talking to people. Uh, I'll go to Killarney at minimum twice a year for clinics. I go there more often. I go for fish and chips, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do clinics there at least twice a year and I'll do some in field. I'll do some at Garden Village, Metogamy, Gogama. Uh, and uh, that's how I get to to, to meet my people. What are you hearing at the door? What, what's people on people's mind this time? Is it primarily the economy? Is it jobs? It's uh, it's, it's the economy. It's the um, direction that uh, Harper's taking our country. And I hear a lot of that. We're going in the wrong direction, and we have to change things. People are ready for a change, and we are going to give them a real change. And uh, they're quite happy when they hear that. Are you hearing <coughs> some of the so-called wedge issues? Are you hearing much about the niqab at the door? Or, or are people concerned about that? I'm hearing a little bit, but not, not uh, very much. Not at the door. I think I've heard it uh, maybe once at the door, niqab. Other than that, it's, it's a discussion that's going on at the, at the Tim Hortons maybe, but it's not at the door. People at the door are concerned about real issues. And the niqab's not a real issue. It's a wedge issue. It, it, it's something that's... Um significant in Quebec. I wonder, is it, is it something that is on the mind of Francophone voters in Nickel Belt that you've heard? Well, I, I, can't, I can't speak for the uh, Francophone voters in Quebec, uh, but I can speak about the Francophone and Anglophone voters in, in Nickel Belt, and it's not a big concern. You see, we're, you, you're hearing that, that voters want change, um, but, you know, they, 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 um, they're not concerned about the niqab type wedge issues so much as they are concerned about real issues. Uh, what sort of real issues are they, do they, are you hearing that they feel that uh, Stephen Harper hasn't addressed or has harmed or has... Well, again, it depends on uh, who answers the door when I knock. If it's an old, older okay. couple, if it's an older couple, they're concerned about their pensions. Uh, they're concerned about uh, wanting to stay, live at home as long as possible. Mm -hmm. They want home care. They want better health care. They want pharma care. Uh, they just want to... Uh, be able to live a, a good life at home uh, because I think we all know that once we uh, uh, seniors get into long-term care facilities or, or hospitals it gets very very expensive on the uh, uh, health care system so seniors want to stay at home if I'm knocking on the door and some young couple answers with a baby in their arm they want to talk about daycare and uh, we do talk about daycare and uh, they're quite happy with our uh, Fifteen dollar a day daycare that uh, we're going to uh, to bring to, to the rest of Canada, based on the Quebec model, which is the best model, well, it's the only model in Canada, and people are quite happy when I tell them uh, we're going to base it on the Quebec model. It seems like everybody knows about the Quebec model, and they're quite happy about that. I w I'd like to talk about the daycare issue too, but if we can just go back to, to seniors for for a second, we have a you know a rising demographic uh, who are going to be hitting uh, that that stage in life where they're going to be requiring a lot more mm. health care. Uh, you know, you, 
the chunk of the healthcare system is taken up by people who are at the ends of their life, mm -hmm. not by the people who are, you know, sort of uh, uh, in their, their working age. Um, what's the NDP? How, how does the NDP proposing that we that we manage um, the national healthcare system in order to ensure that those people have the care that they need? Well, first of all, we have to uh, fund uh, more of the, our uh, health care uh, through the provinces. Uh, our numbers have gone way down. Our percentage of funding has gone way down. We have to bring it back up. But we have to be... Uh, in, so are you talking a, about transfer payments? Transfer then? payments, yeah. They've gone way down. So we have to increase the transfer payment. But other ways of doing it, for example, is by pharmacare. I, I was listening to a, a panel uh, on one of the French uh, stations a couple of weeks ago. And this was a panel of pharmacists, doctors, health care givers, not politicians. And they were talking about pharmacare. And to them, it was a no-brainer having a, a pharmacare system because it reduces the cost. And they just couldn't understand why a country like Canada doesn't have a pharmacare. It's Tommy Douglas's second part of health care was pharmacare. And we've never got there. Uh, but uh, under a Tom Mulcair-led uh, government, we will, we will get there. And we're going to save a lot of money that way. There's a lot of money to be saved with pharmacare. And then we can reinvest that money in transfer payments to, to, to provinces. Any idea how much pharmacare would save us? Um, the number was billions of dollars. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. It's not going to be all in one year. Mm -hmm. It gives us a chance to bulk buy. And it gives the provinces... Uh, uh, more uh, more um, savings in, in, in the long run. Okay. <coughs> Maybe sticking with the, the seniors issue, um, there's been a lot of talk about the, your dementia strategy. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you a few questions about it. Uh, when Mark Saray was in here, we, he made two points, and I'd like to hopefully get you to respond to them. First, he said it wasn't a strategy, but your motion was calling on the feds and the provinces to work together to develop a strategy. Is that a fair characterization of what your bill said? Uh, my, my bill was called a National Dementia Strategy, and part of, of that bill, just part of it, was calling on the, on the federal health minister to bring the, the provincial health minister together, along with uh, caregivers, along with patients, along with uh, health care suppliers or givers, uh, to uh, develop a, a national uh, Alzheimer's strategy. Uh, that all of the, the provinces would be uh, part of. Uh, it also uh, talked about uh, research. We're not going to solve this, uh, this problem of uh, dementia without research. We all agree to that. We all agree. And we'd like to have uh, home care. Uh, the best place for a, and I, I've lived through it, uh, the best place for a, home, uh, a person who has dementia is at home. And that's a proven fact. That was part of the bill, to have more home care so the primary caregiver can, can get some rest uh, because in, in the majority of cases, it's the other spouse that is the uh, caregiver. And the other spouse is basically the same age as the, the person that has uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, in, in, in my case, when my mom ha had Alzheimer's, my, my father was not a young man. And this is a 24-7 job looking after a, an Alzheimer patient. You, know, you, you have to sleep with one eye open at night. And so he needed, he needed some help, and we just uh, were not getting that kind of help uh, that was needed for him. I was still working at the time. My sister was still working at the time. So it was very difficult for, for the family to uh, uh, give my, my father some respite. And so this bill will, will, will do something for that. It'll, it'll increase the amount of uh, home care that a, a patient gets. Because what, like I said a while ago, the best place for a home care for a dementia person is in the house, in their house. The surroundings that they're, they're familiar with. As soon as you move them into long-term care, it seems to, to get worse. And it, uh, it costs a heck of a lot more uh, to be in a long-term care facility than it does uh, supplying home care to a p patient who has uh, dementia. The example is, uh, is my mom. When we finally had to uh, uh, move her into, uh, out of the house, so she went to the hospital uh, for, um, if memory serves means me right, a couple of months. And it's costly uh, to be in a hospital. It costs the, the, the health care system and it costs the family. And when, we f and, and when she got into the hospital, it seemed that she, she got worse. And then when we finally moved her into to Pioneer Manor, she was only there a couple of months before she passed away. Uh, but once she got to Pioneer Manor, I, again, it got worse. She just stopped talking. She could, didn't recognize anybody in, anymore. She just laid in bed until she died. 
So keeping the uh, Alzheimer patient at home is very beneficial to the patient and to the family and to the healthcare system. <clears throat> now the failure of, uh, of your motion, your bill, you said it relied on a liberal member who forgot to stand up. So Ray says that, you know, why were you relying on a liberal MP when instead of your NDP colleagues? Can you talk every, about every, the matching every, off and can you maybe explain every, that? Every, every, single of my, every single one of my uh, colleague voted for that bill. Uh, let, let's make that very, very clear. Every single one of them voted for, for my bill. I think Sarah has been saying that four didn't. They weren't, they, they weren't present there. There, there, was, there was four that were not present, but there were also four uh, liberals that were not present, and there were also some uh, conservatives that were not, not, not present. Uh, uh, take Be uh, Tyrone Benskin, for example, was paired off with a liberal and a conservative who were in Germany on some kind of a, a mission. And so they're paired off, so that, that doesn't matter. That's zero. That, it doesn't count. Uh, but we had a couple that were on long-term sickness, and the Liberals were missing people also. So it's the same. We were missing four, they were missing four. Conservatives were missing, I never checked into them, they were missing some also. But I worked uh, diligently with the Liberal Whip to make sure that all of their uh, members were, uh, were going to vote for this uh, motion, and it was agreed to, that they would support, everyone would support it. I also worked with uh, the Conservative Caucus to make sure that I, I had enough, enough Conservatives uh, that would support this bill, and I had enough. I had enough. Uh, we, we counted and we had enough, and uh, it all fell on the one Liberal uh, that didn't vote. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's unfortunate uh, that she didn't get up to vote. She said she just missed the vote, but uh, you have people beside you, uh, on both sides of you getting up. You got people behind you, you got people in front of you. So to say I just missed the vote, it th really doesn't work for me. Did she apologize? Yes, she did, but what, what good is an apology? I mean, what I wanted to do was win this vote so we could have a national dementia strategy. I had uh, negotiated extensively with the uh, uh, Minister of Health at the time, and uh, it looked like we, we were going to win this vote, but she forgot to get up. Why do you think uh, with, with you know, such a, a huge number of people who are going to be hitting that age where dementia begins to become an issue where um, you know, major health concerns like, mm -hmm. like Alzheimer's, like dementia, are going to be, become, are going to be exploding mm -hmm. really a, across Canada? Why do you think it takes a private member's bill to work towards creating a dementia strategy? Why can't that be a, something that the, you know, the, the government can identify as, a, as an issue and, and act on rather than... Well, you'll have to ask um, Stephen Harper, opinion, I, guess, I guess, but uh, the uh, dementia strategy, my private member's bill, has been incorporated into our platform. Uh, so we, we will have a, dementia, a national dementia strategy when we form government. And uh, again, it's very important. Uh, for the clients, for the families, and for the healthcare system, that we have this national dementia strategy because there's more and more people uh, living with dementia now, and it's it's not only older people anymore. There's a lot of young people that have dementia. Mm -hmm. I have a friend whose 44-year-old wife is uh, in a long-term care facility, and she's got dementia, and she doesn't even recognize her own kids, and she's only 44. And there's more of those. There's more of those coming up in the system year after year after year. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very, very important that we have a national dementia strategy. It's unfortunate that we lost by one vote, but I'm not giving up. What would it look like exactly? You mean you mentioned your, your experience. Mm -hmm. um, the last couple of years I took care of my mother who mm -hmm. had dementia at home. Um, two kids as well, full-time job eventually. Mm -hmm. I mean, the nights were worse. I'm sure you can tell the nights because you're up all night mm -hmm. because you just never know when they're going to get yep. up. Yeah. For someone in, in, in my position, mm -hmm. you know, how would your strategy affect me? Would, would, like, we could get home care during the day, but you mm -hmm. can get it overnight. Well, you, can, you can't... Uh, if you get home care during the day, you can, you can relax, you can rest. Uh, the, the patient with um, uh, Alzheimer's during the night uh, doesn't always wander around. I mean, they do sleep. Uh, it's just that you have to sleep a little bit uh, lighter uh, to make sure that uh, they don't wander around. Um, but if you get to... Uh, rest, if you get to relax during the day while somebody else is looking after your, your spouse, I think that would be uh, very, very helpful. Uh, in our case, when we were able to uh, take care of my mom during the day, uh, we would send our dad out to, to the 
senior craft shop where he could be with some of his friends, where he could relax, where he could do some woodworking. And then when he'd come home, he'd be a, kind of a, a bubbly, more happier person. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it's important. Uh, you're not going to get 24-hour um, home care, but you're gonna get, you should have enough hours to be able to uh, relax and rest. And uh, that way you become a better uh, caregiver. You're a well-known Habs fan, Montreal Canadiens fan. <laughs> One of the, the things you were able to do this term was get the French language broadcast available to your residents. Yep. Um, which, you know, in terms of quality of life, I mean, that's significant for people. Yeah. Uh, but beyond that, what are some of the things that you accomplished this term that, that you're, you're proud of? Let me talk about the Habs first. Sure. You cannot <laughs> imagine. You must. <laughs> I must. You cannot imagine the number of phone calls that I got from uh, Habs fans that don't even understand French. I got calls from Calgary, I got calls from Guelph, I got all kinds of calls from Toronto of people who said, I can't speak French, I don't understand what they're saying, I just want to watch. I turn the volume down and I want to watch. So we worked, uh, I worked uh, diligently with uh, LDS, first of all, CRTC, uh, the National Hockey League, Rogers, I spoke to all of them, Shaw, uh, Bell Mobility, and uh, I'm, I, I talked to him again last week because, of course, the uh, season is starting again. And as soon as they had an exhibition game that was blacked out, I started getting the phone calls. And uh, we were able to get it on RDS uh, for Eastlink. Uh, most of the HAB games for $60. Most of them, I think it was 60 games. The other games are available on uh, TVA. Uh, but I got a, a, an email just last week uh, from Shaw who didn't have the Canadians games uh, last year, they now have them. So I've only got uh, Bell Mo Mobility left to, to convince uh, that uh, it's, it's a good thing for them to carry the Habs game and it's a good thing for the NHL because their viewership has gone way down. So it's good for the NHL, it's good for all Canadians, not, not only the Francophones, because the guy I spoke to in Calgary didn't know a word of, 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 of French, but he said, I want to watch my Canadians. <laughs> So now he can watch them. <laughs> okay, but beyond that, what, what are some of the, the things that you're really uh, proud of that you've accomplished the last four years? Well, I think um, the dementia strategy is one because a lot of people, um, caregivers, personal caregivers, patients with Alzheimer's, they don't want to talk about it. It, it seems to be an, an, an elephant in the room. Nobody wants to talk about it. So it's, it's been in, in, in the media. I think it's been in the media because of my bill. I started speaking with uh, the Alzheimer's Society in Canada. Uh, there's been several uh, documentaries. Uh, I think uh, Suzuki, Mr. S Dr. Suzuki had one about his mom on uh, W5, I believe. There's been several others. Uh, I can't remember which ones, but there's a, also been a couple of really good movies about, uh, about dementia. So it's, it's come out of the, of the woodwork. It's not, it's not the elephant in the room that it was before. And I think uh, we've accomplished that through my, through my bill. But I also meet a lot of, uh, a lot of my constituents with my, uh, my, my clinics. And uh, I, I just love uh, going from community to community to meet different people and help them with their, uh, their problems. Uh, there are uh, a lot of people who have problems out there. There's a lot of seniors who are just living almost in poverty that need help. Uh, so I, I lo really love uh, talking to people and, uh, and helping them. Uh, we've solved a lot of um, disability uh, cases in the, uh, um, my office in both Valcaran and, and Sturgeon Falls uh, where people didn't even know uh, they were a, 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 a um, candidate. Uh, they didn't even know that there was funding available uh, for them if they had a disability, disability tax credit is what it's called. And I remember we got uh, one lady who had been fighting with the, the, the government uh, for years and years. She came to our office and within three weeks she had $60,000 in her pocket. So that's, and she had tears in her eyes and she was, she was just bawling. She was so happy. That's the kind of things that I, I like to do. But I've also uh, been really involved with the, uh, the Ring of Fire. I am uh, the mining critic for the, for the NDP and we are the only party that has a, a mining critic. We also are, have a 20-member caucus of, of uh, MPs who have some form of a mine, a smelter, a refinery in their uh, writing. So we get together and we discuss mining issues. I was <coughs> able to bring uh, 
six or seven MPs on a tour of the Ring of Fire. And it was uh, very, very interesting. And I've been up there twice, and I've, I've uh, uh, met with all of the companies involved in the Ring of Fire. I've uh, been able to bring, uh, I, I set up a, a round table at the uh, PDAC conference in Toronto. It's the biggest mining conference in the world. Mm -hmm. We were able to set up a, a, a round table with probably about uh, uh, 40 different uh, miners of some kind. Valley was there, uh, Glencore, uh, all of the uh, companies in the, involved in the Ring of Fire were there. Uh, our leader was there to hear what their concerns were. And uh, those uh, meetings have, have paid off uh, because in our, uh, in our platform now we uh, will uh, what's called the flow-through shares which were, which were uh, renewed uh, on a yearly basis, sometimes at the last minute and sometimes they were even renewed a little bit late like last year. Uh, we, are, we are now committed to having those uh, permanent, in place permanently and that's going to uh, take a lot of pressure off of the, uh, the junior miners. Uh, we've also got the, um, the tax credit for, for uh, innovation and machinery uh, that will help uh, people in, in, in the ring of fire. Uh, so uh, well, we've, we've also promised the, uh, the, the one billion dollars uh, for the ring of fire, so let's, let's, let's not forget about that. That's not insignificant. No, That's not insignificant and it, it matches the one billion from the province and that uh, money is available right away. So if you need, uh, in the first year, if you need $60 million, it's there. It's not limited to 50, mil billion, 50 million. It's, if, you don't, if you only need, uh, in the fourth, fifth year, if you only need 20 million, it's there. So we can start working on this project right away. And by working on this project right away, it will create a lot of jobs up there, but it'll also create a lot of jobs right here in Sudbury. Because as you know, we are the mining cluster here in Sudbury. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of companies that are in Sudbury right now who will benefit greatly from developing of the Ring of Fire. So that's why I took those MPs up there, just to show them how important it was. And one of the first things that they told us when we got up there, uh, talking to, uh, I think it was Mo Leving from KWG, yeah. he yeah. says, you hear in the news that this is a 60-year project? It's not. This is at least a 100-year project. And it's going to create a lot of jobs. On the Ring of Fire, um, there's been a lot of elections in Serbia the last few years. So I've, you know, I've asked a lot of politicians mm -hmm. about the Ring of Fire. What I've never really heard is um, a roadmap to successfully developing it. Um, you know, talk about potential, mm -hmm. you know, the, all the benefits that could be there. Uh, some blame the province, some blame the feds, some blame, you know, uh, commodity prices. Mm -hmm. um, with the work that you've done on it, what's the, the, the first thing that's really got to happen to get this thing going? And, you know, can you articulate a roadmap to successfully developing it? Yeah, I think we can do a roadmap to, we have to treat it as a, uh, let's treat the Ring of Fire as a uh, municipality. And let's make a plan of where the roads are going to go. Let's make a plan of where the power is coming from. Uh, let's make a plan of uh, what the involvement in the, in the First Nations are going to be, uh, what the miners want, where's the road going to go, where's the, if, if there's a, a rail line, where's it going to go. Uh, treat it as a municipality and let's develop a planning uh, agreement. Um, when I was at the, uh, when so we is had... is that the first step that has to happen? That's, to that's, come with this? we need an agreement on, on how we're going to develop this. And all of, all of the companies uh, have to come together with the First Nations. We can't have six or seven different plans. One plan, just one plan, that's all we need to develop that ring of fire because it's so important to the economy, of not only Ontario and, and, and Sudbury, but all of Canada. When I had the... Uh, uh, when I was the crit critic for the natural resources, we did. Uh, I was able to convince the uh, conservatives and the liberals, because they have a majority on, on, on the committee, that we should have a study on the Ring of Fire. And we did have that study, and it brought out a lot of, uh, a lot of issues that they were not aware of. Um, the miners that came to the um, committee meetings told us one thing. Just tell us what you want. Give us the rules. We'll follow the rules. If we don't know what the rules are, we cannot budget according to the rules. So all the government has to do is tell us what the rules are. The First Nations, the thing they said, is we're not against the Ring of Fire. We are not. We just want to be at the table. And I think that's, that's reasonable. Tell the miners what the rules are, bring the First Nations to the table. We'll get together with the two levels of government and the municipalities and develop a plan for the Ring of Fire.
that's the only way it's going to get done. Ostensibly, the province is, you know, supposed to be the sort of the lead on that. They kind of set themselves up that way. They came up with the Ring of Fire Development Corporation. They, you know, put a few sort of steps in place to portray themselves as the lead. But the project never really hasn't. Yeah. I mean, it's still it's still kind of swirling in limbo. Um, as the as the federal MP for for Nickel Belt, what can you do to help? Is there anything that you can do, I guess, to help? Um, uh, you know, contribute or get this thing moving a little. Well, uh, I've met with the uh, First Nations and, and, and the um, companies on numerous occasions. And it, it's easy for the provincial government to send out a press release. We've done this, we're doing this, and, and nothing seems to get done. But once uh, we elect uh, Tom Mulcair as our Prime Minister, it's, it's going to get done because we are going to match the province with the $1 billion. And once we have $2 billion in the pot, then I think it's pretty, uh, it, it means we're serious. Mm -hmm. We haven't been able to get that billion dollars from the, from the Conservative government. We will get it from the NDP government. And once you have two billion dollars in the pot, that's a lot of money that can get going. We can, we can bring in some, some hydro for, for the mines and for the First Nations at the same time. When I was up there and I went to um, Port Hope, it's just mm -hmm. the way they live up there on, on diesel-generated power it's it's just not it's not Canadian it's not Canada it's like a third world country up there so it, by bringing in hydro we can wean them off the diesel that that is flown in uh, that, that winter I was there was flown in because the ice level was not uh, good enough the ice level was not uh, good enough so there's a high cost there and one thing uh, that we noticed is that they had some uh, tanks that were leaking diesel and of course that's that's not very good for the for the environment uh, so we can do we can do a lot uh, with the First Nations and with the, the mining companies. The mining companies want uh, the First Nations at the table. Uh, they've told me over and over again we will cooperate with the mining uh, with the First Nations. The First Nations have told me we would just want to be at the table or we're going to co cooperate, uh, but we need leadership, and we're not getting that right now from the province and from the federal government. And when we match the one billion dollars. Uh, we're also going to provide leadership. Speaking of, you, you know, the sort of quality of life and issues like that for people mm -hmm. who live in sort of rural and remote communities in the north, the NDP is the only federal party that came out with a northern platform. Mm -hmm. um, why, why is that? Why did the party feel that it was important to, 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 per, to include that? Well, since I've, been, since, since I've been a, a, an MP, we've always had a, a northern platform. Mm -hmm. Every uh, election we've had a northern platform, and it's important to, uh, to have a northern platform because northern Ontario is different from so southern Ontario. It's not the same things uh, that apply in the north. So we, uh, as the, the northern MPs, we uh, sit, sit at the table and we uh, develop our own platform for northern Ontario and we present it to the, to the main party and make some adjustments as we go along and then we can have a good northern Ontario platform with our issues and our ideas in, in the platform. You've been a local politician here for a while. You mentioned mm -hmm. you serve in Rayside Council. Um, one of the issues that is always big for municipalities here is infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, in Sudbury, the uh, the top sort of priority has been identified as Maley Drive. Mm -hmm. um, I know that your party is making a commitment to spend, I think, one point five billion more a year mm -hmm. on municipal mm -hmm. uh, infrastructure. Well, where do you stand on Maley, and what do you see as the city's infrastructure priorities? Well, I, I, I can't uh, decide for the city what their uh, priority is, but I would assume it would be Maley Drive. And uh, the um, uh, province has uh, committed uh, supporting the Maley Drive. And uh, when we form government, we will support Maley Drive because if it's identified as a priority for the municipality, we have the funds for that. It's not up to us to tell the city what their priorities are. And you've probably, if you've listened at all to Tom O'Care, He's repeated over and over again uh, that he will consult with the provinces at least twice a year. As, as a, a former provincial uh, cabinet minister, he knows how important it is for the federal government to consult with the provinces. And that's what he's going to do by having two meetings a year, one in Ottawa and one in, in different uh, rotating provinces. We've got a few other uh, sort of items on the agenda. There's uh, obviously water and sewer. There's roads. New arena, uh, there's been talk of an uh, art center here for quite mm -hmm. some time. 
under um, the rules of the infrastructure plan that NDP have, would some of those projects be eligible for funding? I think uh, that'll be up to the uh, municipality to decide what their uh, projects are. I mean, we're not going to tell the city of Sudbury you need a new arena, so we'll give you some money. But they would be eligible for funding? I mean, I, it, under the Canada Build Fund, if they meet the criteria, they will get it. I'm not saying they're eligible, but if the criteria include uh, a sports arena, then they're el uh, eligible. But I'm not exactly sure if the arenas uh, are in uh, the criteria. I don't know what the exact criteria are, but the rest of our uh, platform will be released very, very soon. As a, you know, if you weren't Claude Gravel, you know, candidate for MP, as a voter, you would be for mailing? I would be for mailing? Yeah. What do you mean? I'm sorry, I don't... You would, su you would be for, you would support, support the Mailey Drive project if you weren't... Oh, uh, for Mailey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, formally is not a word. As far as I, I was wondering <laughs> what kind of word is that. Uh, Mealy Drive, I think, is um, probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert, uh, but I would imagine it would take a lot of uh, traffic out, out of uh, LaSalle Boulevard and uh, uh, the major streets in Sudbury. I, I can only imagine that it would, as long as it's built uh, properly. Uh, again, as a, as, a, as a voter, if you were just a voter, you would be for a new Sudbury Arena? You would like to see the city have a new... Uh... I uh, would like the city to decide, or, or whoever their powers that be, uh, decide uh, if uh, Sudbury needs a new arena. I mean, but do you, I, think, do you I, think Sudbury needs a new arena? I, just Claude Gravel the man, not Claude Gravel the, the, the MP. Not, uh, Claude Gravel the hockey fan. As Claude Gravel I've the gone, Habs fan, yes. I've been to the, uh, I used to be a season ticket holder for the Sudbury Wolves at one time. Before I got elected, I could go to hockey games. Now I can't. Uh, and um, I think it would be nice to have a new arena. It would be very nice. Uh, can, we, can we fund it? That's up to the city of Sudbury. It's not up to the federal government. Mm -hmm. It would be very nice to have an arts center. Is the government going to decide that? No. It will be the councillors and the mayor that will decide, and the citizens of Sudbury. It's not going to be Claude Gravel, the MP. The Sudbury by-election scandal has been discussed a bit during this election. Um, what do you say to people that, who say that it's a matter of opportuni opportunism, that the New Democrats are trying to uh, take advantage of something that makes the Liberals look bad? Rather, than, like, Do you think it has relevance for this election? I think um, people are going to um, vote for the NDP because they want change in, uh, in Ottawa. Uh, we've gone from uh, the corrupt liberals to the corrupt conservatives and back to the corrupt liberals. We've gone from the debt-ridden liberals to the debt-ridden conservatives. And we've gone back and forth between the blue and the red. There's a, there's a real change we can have in, in Ottawa by going to a, a different party that is more concerned about what happens to Canadians. And that's what we're going to bring to Ottawa. We're going to bring a different change. And it's going to be a real change for Canadians. About the $15 a day child care, you know, it, I'm, obviously that's something my wife is, a, is an early childhood educator. She has been for, for 20 years. So, you know, issues uh, about, you know, educating Canada's youngest students is something that's you know very important in our in our household. It's also something that has you know the cost of which is also something that's prevented us from being able to take family vacations mm -hmm. on occasion mm -hmm. and, and and all sorts of those sorts of things. But and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, Quebec's fifteen dollar a day childcare they they've had some trouble paying for it. Am I not, am I am I incorrect? I think uh, well, first of all, it's twelve dollars in Quebec, mm -hmm. and uh, it's. Um, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know, it's, it's not an issue. It's something that's uh, it's very progressive uh, in Quebec only because of child care uh, or daycare. Uh, they've been able to create 90,000 jobs. So that's a lot of jobs mm -hmm. that we can create with, uh, with child care. And it allows the, and in most cases, it's the, the, the mother that stays home. So it allows the mother a chance to go out and work and help with the family expenses. And that, that's very important. Uh, because in today's uh, economy, uh, the wages are not like what they used to be uh, before. Uh, and uh, it would allow the, the, the women, in most cases, to go out and, 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 and work, uh, which is good. It's good for the economy, and it's good for the uh, caregivers, the daycare operators. If we can move to taxes for a second. I know that the uh, New Democrats are promising to cut small business mm -hmm. taxes, mm -hmm. uh, but will raise taxes on larger corporations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
the larger corporations are the major employers. You know, mm -hmm. in yes. well, I mean, in Valet is a huge employer. Glencore is a huge employer. What kind of effect is that going to have on, on the mining jobs? Well, for, first of all, I, I just want to correct you. I think the real job creators are the small, uh, small businesses and medium-sized business. And by reducing their uh, uh, taxes from 11% uh, to 9%, uh, uh, it's going to reduce their uh, their cost by 20%, which is huge, uh, that they can reinvest in their company, they can hire somebody else. Now we're going to raise the uh, corporate taxes to 17%, uh, I believe, and that is well, well lower than anybody else. It's way lower than the, the Americans. So that should not have an effect on, on anyone. As long as we keep it lower than the states, we're okay. We should be and okay. We should be okay, and 17% is a lot lower than the than the states. Okay. Okay. Oh, I, I think we're good. You think we're good? Yeah. Do you have any more questions? Uh, I don't have any more questions actually. Right. That was a pretty broad ranging conversation, yeah, so I think we covered a lot of ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much, Claude, for uh, for sitting down with us today. I really appreciate your time. Really appreciate you coming in and uh, you know taking time out of your busy campaign to sit down with mm -hmm. us. Uh, I want to thank you all for uh, for watching um, the uh, the all of these videos uh, we we did over the course of the last week. There's seven hours of. of of um, conversations with the candidates in this uh, year's election, I encourage you to try and uh, you know watch the candidates that are that are running in your riding, get to know them a little bit better. If you don't have time to watch the videos, they're also available for download as podcasts, so you can listen to them at your leisure. And uh, I want to thank you very much for joining us today for, for NorthernLife.ca. I'm Mark Gentili for uh, Darren McDonald. Thanks very much.